Let's start with the concept of a block cipher, uh, for example, AES. It encrypts a message of a certain fixed length, say 128 bits into the same length of cipher texts uh, with a hardwired key. But block ciphers are somewhat rigid because of the fixed block lengths. A new concept called format preserving encryption has been introduced. And it's basically a cipher that encrypts a message from a general domain ID into the same domain ID. And this general domain ID is uh, typically, uh, like, uh, these domains are passcodes or social security numbers or credit card numbers. As we can see, the, uh, they, they are not specifically uh, binary strings, and they are, not, uh, they are much smaller than 128 bits, and uh, FPE provides a method to encrypt uh, those type of uh, domains. And uh, it, FP specifically designed for legacy databases because it provides a way uh, to encrypt in a transparent way to its application that are running top of the legacy databases. So no significant schema changes are uh, required or no significant applications, uh, they, they need to be ready to. Um, one way to construct and format preserving encryption could be to uh, use a conventional block cipher, AES, for example, with a padded input and truncated output, but as we can guess, this uh, disables the decryption. So we need more neat methods, and they are not easy to construct FPEs. Uh, indeed, we can classify the FPE constructions in two classes. In the first class, we have some provably secure constructions, but they are not fast enough for practitioners, unfortunately. Uh, on the other hand, we have NIST standards. They are fast enough for practice, but the security of these constructions are supported by cryptanalysis, which is exactly the topic of this talk. And this, more importantly, uh, the constructions called FF1 and FF3 in NIST standards are based on FISL networks, and they are tweakable block ciphers. And I will come to that, uh, what they mean in a second. But uh, let me remind you that the topic of this talk is FF3 construction. Um, so let's look at the FISL network, which is a widely known iterative cipher. Uh, it was invented by Dr. Faisal in IBM in early 70s. Uh, each iteration in this uh, network is called a round. And here we see an example, an instance of a FISL network with four rounds. Uh, each round consists of a secure round function, a typically secure PRF, and a group operation defined on a domain D. And uh, I will explain how encryption happens in a couple of minutes. Uh, so before that, let's look at what tweakable format preserving encryption is. Uh, as you may guess, uh, FPE is a deterministic encryption because uh, the length of the message has to be preserved in the ciphertext, so it cannot be randomized. And uh, as I said, again, FP is designed for small uh, messages, small domain sizes, so it is vulnerable to the dictionary attacks. It is very likely that we will have two messages equal uh, to each other and they will encrypt to the same ciphertext. To prevent dictionary attacks, uh, the constructions introduced a tweak. And these tweaks, as, as long as they are different than each other, for, for example, for these two encryptions, as long as these two tweaks are different than each other, they define two different pseudo random permutations. So this uh, prevents the dictionary attacks. So tweaks are very essential for, for FPE. And more importantly, these tweaks are uh, publicly available and under the control of the adversary. Um, so let's look at FF3 uh, with a uh, FISL uh, networks. Um, to simplify FF3, we can look at uh, the permutation on integer domains, say, say ZN square. And ZN square is because of the two branches of FISL network. And uh, in here, what FF, FP, FF3 does is that it uh, takes the input right off of the input, it pads it to the 96 bits, and it concatenates it with the 32 bits of tweak, and it inputs to the AES. The output is truncated with uh, the modular, uh, modular operation. So this is basically how uh, FF3 is designed. Um, from now on, I will drop the secret keys and tweaks from the notation, so don't get confused. Um, again, very quickly, what FF3 was in NIST standards. The uh, specifications for FF3 is the number of runs are uh, eight. 
and the domain size must be at least 100. Okay. And the security, uh, so its targeted security is 128 bits. Since it's based on Feistel network, all the security notions, the security uh, coming from Feistel networks inherits to FF3. And FF3 in additionally asserts PRP security against chosen plain text and uh, ciphertext attacks. Okay. And uh, in this work, I like to um, introduce our contributions in two parts. In the first part, I will be only talking about the generic attacks on Feistel networks without mentioning F what FF3 is. Uh, and in this Feistel networks, I will be specifically focusing on a modular addition as a group operation and on integer domains. In the second part, uh, I will describe an attack on FF3 construction by using, uh, by using a glitch in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the construction, the design of the FF3. And as far as we know, the, our attack works with the best known query and time uh, complexity. And good news is that it is easy to fix in order to prevent it from our present attack. And we don't know what happens for the future attack. Um, so I first want to talk a little bit about equivalent round functions and what they mean, because I will use uh, this uh, fact as an intuition for our attack. And uh, for that, <coughs> I like to show you how encryption happens very briefly and quickly. Maybe most of you guys are already know how uh, encryption happens. But uh, for three round Faisal network, uh, we have seen here, with an intermediate value C, which is unknown to the adversary, uh, the encryption uh, happens as follows. The, for the right half of the message Y, it is input to the first round function F0, and its output added to the left part of the message to generate intermediate value C. And as soon as C is generated, the, now this intermediate value is input to the second round function, and its output is added to the right half of the message to generate the left, right half of the ciphertext. And we continue for it this last round uh, in the same way in order to generate the left part of the ciphertext. This is how the round function F0, uh, the set of round functions F0, F1, and F2 encrypts the message XY into ZT. And I, I like to show you that this is not uniquely defined uh, encryption. What I mean is that I like you to assume that I add a delta value over here to the output of the first round function. So what happens here is that the, the additional delta value is transmitted to the intermediate C value. So for the second, the aim is that to show that XY is going to be encrypted to ZT again, but with different triples of round functions. But the input output behavior of the encryption will be same. So in the second round function, in order to eliminate this inter additional uh, delta value from the intermediate value, I like to sub sub subtract this delta value before inputting to the second round function. So I didn't, uh, I, uh, this again, uh, generates the same half of the ciphertext. And this, uh, in the last round function, since the additional delta value stays in the intermediate part again, I like to subtract this, subtract this delta value from the output of last round function to eliminate it. Hence, it generates the same left part of the ciphertext. So these two triples, F0, F1, F2, and the, the one that is defined over here, uh, has the same input-output behavior of encryption. So what that means is that the adversary can fix or set one output of an arbitrary input for first round function. So it gives this flexibility to the uh, adversary. So now, uh, in my terminology, I like to tell you that the, the round function recovery means that recovering the round functions, either the true one, which is used for encryption, which is uh, in the previous slide, F0, F1, and F2, defined as F0, F1, F2. Uh, the re round function recovery mean, that means that either this true triple is recovered or one of the equivalent triples is going to be recovered because they all will define the same uh, encryption for uh, as I shown you. And uh, there is also round, uh, re codebook recovery. In that uh, case, the adversary can recover the mapping of messages to their corresponding ciphertexts, and uh, it doesn't have to be the, the, the round function recovery. 
So the very, very simple way of code book recovery is that to uh, en make an encryption, uh, make an uh, Oracle queries for each messages, and we will be able to learn which uh, messages map to the which map to which ciphertext. So the decryption will be simple. And in these both attack types, the uh, both attacks are as powerful as recovering the secret key. Okay. Okay, so uh, the first part is going to be the generic attacks on Faisal network, and the, uh, the R represents here the round numbers. So I will first give an attack for three round attacks, uh, three round Faisal networks, and as far as I know, there is uh, no other known attack with uh, round function recovery. So this is the only work I know, like the R work is the only work I, uh, I have known. It's a, a non plain text attack with given query and time complexities and no gap. And uh, we also have for the attack against four round Faisal networks. Again, round function recovery with non plain text power given to the adversary with the given query and time complexities. But uh, we are not alone. There is another uh, work by Biryuko et al. Uh, they have better time complexity with the same query complexity, but in their case, the adversary has given chosen plain text and cipher text po power as opposed to non plain text power. Okay, so the adversary is a little bit more powerful in their attack. And uh, similarly, we have given the uh, attack for against five rounds Faisal network with chosen plain text uh, power uh, and given complexities over here. Uh, again, Mirikov at all defines five round uh, Faisal network uh, attacks with the chosen plain text and cipher text uh, power uh, given to the adversary. And uh, yeah, our complexities are better with the less powerful adversarial model. So, uh, and uh, what is good about our work is that we can extend our attacks to six and more rounds. And uh, they are again chosen plain text uh, attacks. And I will be just talking about the very detailed uh, three round attack and very briefly four round attack in this talk. So let's start with the three round attack. The uh, input to the uh, given to the adversary is that a message ciphertext pairs with unknown intermediate values. Okay, and I will call this set as uh, S. And the output of the uh, attack by, by the adversary is going to be the either partial tables of round functions or full tables of round functions. Okay, so again, we, I work with the three round Faisal network with unknown intermediate values. So in the first step, the adversary picks a pair, x0, y0, z0, and t0, arbitrarily. Starts with an arbitrary input out, uh, uh, message ciphertext pair. And uh, uh, as we have talked, the adversary is free to set one output of an one arbitrary input in an arbitrary manner. So the adversary picks y0, and it evaluates f0 at this point as a 0. It's free to do, he's free to do that. The adversary is free to do that. So as soon as the adversary evaluates y0, evaluates f0 on this y0 point, it can start doing encryption. And it learns what is the intermediate value c0 is by doing this encryption. And since it learned what is, F, uh, what is C0 value is, now it can evaluate F1 on this point. So we filled one point over here for F0 and one point for F1. And uh, again, we know intermediate value now, and we can learn one point for F2. And this, is, this has done with only one message ciphertext pair. In the second step, the adversary will pick a pair with a matching right half of the ciphertext. Why? Because it knows how to evaluate this right half of the uh, right half of the ciphertext uh, in the last round fun in the last round function. So the adversary now will try to decrypt backward, and it will learn again the intermediate values for this pair, which is a C1, and uh, how to evaluate F1 on this point, and uh, similarly how to evaluate F0 on point Y1. And uh, with the second cif message ciphertext pair, it filled a little bit more the uh, tables. N and the next step, the adversary will pick now a uh, message ciphertext pair which m m with matching right half of the messages from the previous, uh, previously picked 
pair. Why? Because, why? Again, because the adversary, okay, sorry about that, this is supposed to be Y2. Um, the, because, because the adversary knows how to evaluate F0 uh, on point Y2. And it, it, again, enable him to uh, encrypt uh, by finding the intermediate values. Okay. So the adversary continues this yo-yo game until no more uh, points in any of the round functions, uh, the tables, uh, the, the tables for the round functions are recovered. Okay. So now the question is that how much of these uh, partial tables are recovered? In order to answer this question, we like we, we like to model our set S as bipartite graph. And in this bipartite graph, the vertices are with right half of the, uh, all the possible right half of the messages, which are Y values, and all the possible right half of the ciphertext, which are T values. And the domain size to the round function was N. So uh, this, th those are the vertices. And the edges are now the defined with uh, each pair inside the S. So as soon as we see a pair YT pair in the set S, we will put an edge in this graph. So all the algorithm, the attack algorithm is doing here is that to look for a connected component starting from a, an arbitrary point Y0. Okay, so the adversary start with Y0, it, founds an, uh, it finds an edge between Y0, T0, and in the second step it found another edge from T0 to another Y value, Y value, and from then it continues exploring this graph. And now what is uh, happening here is that in this, uh, trying to f the, in this uh, algorithm, the, how do we find a connected component? Like the, how big it will look like, right? And if the size of set S, the, realize that the size of set S is going to be the number of edges over here. And I'd like to, uh, the adversary is trying to explore all possible uh, vertices over here, starting from an arbitrary point. So uh, if the Faisal network is a secure uh, Faisal network, this graph should look like a random graph. So what we know from random graph theory is that if the size of S or number of edges is N log N, then this graph is, uh, uh, with high probability, this graph is going to be fully connected. And if it is not fully connected, uh, what is the probability that uh, being a giant, having a giant connected component? So again, from random graph theory, the size of S, if the size of S is N, with high probability, the, uh, this uh, bipartite graph will have a giant connected component. And uh, this is basically the, uh, the justification of our algorithm. And uh, here are some experimental results. Uh, in, the, in here we have set S, the size of set S parameterized with the theta value, which is shown in the x-axis here. And the y-axis is basically stands for two different things. For thick lines, it stands for the fraction of experiments, which is fully recover, uh, recovering all the round functions over 10,000 uh, experiments in independent runs. And the thin uh, lines, it shows the fraction of recovered F0 depending on uh, theta. And uh, if you see here, the fraction of recovered, uh, recovered F0s, uh, are, they are not depend on, depending on N at all. So the fraction is always, uh, regardless of uh, N, the fraction of recovered F0 is always uh, giving the similar uh, fraction, similar uh, figures. Okay, so, and I like to quickly switch to the four round attack. Uh, but I'm not going to get into details because we don't have time for that. But the basic idea over here is that since we know how to uh, we know how to reconstruct the tables for three rounds, if we know if we have a set of non plain text cipher text pairs, the question is can we reduce the attack for four round Faisal networks into three round Faisal network attacks? And uh, the way to do that is to basically try to characterize F0, which is the first round function over here, in a way that we learn some intermediate values, C values, and then the rest of the graph will look like a three round Faisal network, and we already know how to uh, reconstruct these round functions with a three round attack, with non plain text cipher text pairs. And uh, the, to, to characterize the first round function is not easy. First of all, it's not so uh, intuitive. 
but uh, yeah, I don't have time for details and you can talk to me after uh, the presentation if you like. And uh, the results I would like to show you is, uh, you is here. It's important because of the data query complexity, which is uh, shown with M value, which is parameterized with uh, L, and it is typically set to uh, three in the experimental results. Uh, I like, what I like to say is that the, the success probability means that the entire run function have been recovered out of these many trials. And these trials are uh, run for different independent keys. Okay? And when n gets larger and larger, the success probability gets uh, larger as well. It, it gets close to one. The four round attack succeeds as well. So we are good to go. Now I like to switch the gears to the FF3 construction very quickly. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, how the FF3 construction uh, looks like. It's an eight round Feistel network with uh, the different round functions. And the way to, to uh, the round functions are basically all are same functions under the same key. And uh, what happens over here is that the generic, the tweak, generic tweak T is divided into two halves, left and right halves. And it is XORed with the round index for each round. Okay. So these two round functions now pair by the different round functions, defining different uh, PRPs, or PAP, de defining different PRFs. Okay. So this is the domain separation FF3 construction is considering. And uh, we will exploit this uh, design because it is uh, some weaknesses. Uh, before that, in this work, uh, the Again, we give a round function recovery attack with <coughs> chosen plain text and tweak uh, power that uh, the adversary has. And the query complexity is in this times the tweaks. Uh, and the time complexity is n to the fifth. And there is another work given by Bellare in CCS 2015, uh, which is a slightly different flavor because it's not the round function recovery. It is a different security notion. And against this security notion, they give an attack. And uh, in here, the time and tweak complexity are equal to this. I didn't have space, so I'm sorry for that. But uh, these two are same, time complexity and tweak complexity here. And uh, they give an attack against FF3 and FF1, not only FF3. So it is maybe not so uh, fair to compare these results, but yeah. Um, so again, coming back to the FF3 construction with tweak T, I like to introduce its uh, sibling with tweak T prime. T prime is basically T XORed with four. And why? It is, uh, the, the, the basically it's a chosen tweak attack, uh, the, the attack I'm presenting now. And uh, it is basically important to tweak, the pick at another tweak T prime with XORed with tweak T because uh, it gives us uh, this nice slided uh, versions of each other. So what is happening here is that the upper half of the uh, left encryption is equal to the bo uh, bottom uh, half of the right encryption and uh, vice versa. We are here. running so. out of time, so please wrap up. OK. Uh, so very quickly, uh, we start with an arbitrary message. We apply a chain, chain encryption with the tweak T and secret key, uh, key, key, and we do it A many times. And same uh, is done with the tweak T prime, which is X, T XOR with four. And all the adversary is trying to do, do is that to find a mapping uh, of X, Y, I, J, which is the J encryption of I column over here. Uh, and it, this uh, is going to be mapped to X, Y by bar I prime zero under G. And if the adversary can detect that the rest will follow and uh, we will have some input outputs of four round Faisal network, which is defined with G and H. Okay, so we will be able to reduce our attack to a uh, four round attack okay, over here. And what is uh, the, to see the success probability of our attack, we just need to see these two segments of length B should overlap at, uh, at least M points. And M was the query complexity of our known four round, uh, four round Faisal network attack, non plain text attack. So all we need to look at is that what is the probability of these two segments overlap on M points. And if they do uh, overlap on its M points, we, we have enough data to reconstruct four round functions uh, defined with G and H, both of them. Okay. And here are the results. Uh, again, 
uh, A and B are defined here. The number of arbitrary plane takes to apply chain encryption, and B is the length of the chain encryption. And when N goes uh, larger, the success probability gets larger. The success probability is, again, to recover all the round functions, eight round functions. Okay. And uh, the conclusion is that we, 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 uh, we are not sure how Feistel networks behave with small domain sizes. Maybe we need a little more research for that. And also FF3 suffers from the bad domain separation, and it is uh, luckily easy to fix. Instead of XORing the round, uh, tweak with the round index, it just to concatenate it, and it will be uh, preventing uh, our, uh, against our attack. Now, thank you so much for your attention.